I'm David Borax, and you're I'm David Borax, and you're listening to Charlotte Talks on ninety point seven WFAE. I'm sitting in for Mike Collins today. Today we're looking at the United Way of Central Carolinas and how it's helping take care of neighborhoods and people in the Charlotte region. Our first guest will be Laura Clark, the United Way's new CEO, who is several months into the job, and we'll talk to her about that and how the United Way has been adapting to community needs. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Glad to be here. And one of the United Way's current initiatives is called Unite Charlotte, which started after the week of protests and unrests in 2016 after the police shooting of Keith Lamont Scott. Those protests brought new attention to some of the city's underlying social problems, such as housing and income inequality and economic mobility. With us to talk about that is Brandon Neal, the volunteer chair of the Unite Charlotte Committee under the United Way. Hello, Brandon. Hello. Thank you. Great to be here. And later in the program, we'll expand the conversation to include representatives from two organizations on the front lines of hunger and homelessness in Charlotte, Shenavia Montgomery of Crisis Assistance Ministry and Stephanie Chateau of the Men's Shelter of Charlotte. Hello to you guys. Hello. Hi, good morning. Good morning. First, Laura Clark. She's a Charlotte native who joined the United Way of Central Carolinas in 2016 as Executive Vice President and Chief Impact Officer. On September 7th, she began. She became the CEO, taking over for Sean Garrett. He left Charlotte to run the United Way of Metro Chicago. Laura formerly was CEO of Renaissance West Community Initiative. That's a group in a new neighborhood on Charlotte's west side that replaced a former housing project, Boulevard Homes. And before that, she ran the Larry King Center at Charlotte's Council for Children's Rights. And I believe you had a stint at United Way in the past before that. Is that right? I did. Uh, Laura is a policymaker, advocate, and researcher who, from my experience, knows Charlotte inside and out. So, Laura, uh, first question, uh, how did you end up as CEO? Why did you want to do this job? You know, as a Charlotte native, there's nothing that matters more to me than this town and its residents. And and I had the tremendous benefit of growing up in a community that had lots of opportunity for me. My parents came here looking for opportunity. They only had high school educations. They believed Charlotte was going to offer more for them and their children, and they were right. And so as an adult, to find that that wasn't true for all the children that were growing up in Charlotte at the same time, to me, the opportunity to come back and lead United Way, which is at the forefront of addressing those issues and creating opportunity for all children, was you know, perhaps the honor of my career to get to do. Well, how did grow, growing up in that situation in Charlotte affect your choice of a career, and kind of how did you get there? You know, as a child, my parents really prioritized us giving back and being part of the community and always instilling in us that we were really lucky and that uh, we had opportunities that many didn't have and that they didn't have and that they came to Charlotte and found better housing and better jobs and were able to create that life for their children. And so I always had that sense in me, um, even going through college and graduate school, that my career was going to be in service and in giving back. And what was your training in? Did you uh, go to school for this or did you? uh... So I'm actually trained as a clinical and community psychologist at the at the master's level. I got uh, to the end of my clinical training in graduate school and realized that I didn't think I really wanted to be a therapist and came home and told my husband and parents that. And they said, well, that's great. What are you going to do now? And I got really lucky, and my first job out of graduate school was at the United Way doing community research and program evaluation. So the United Way uh, is a different place than it was then. Uh, Give us a little comparison. Uh, What was it like then? It is. I mean, United Way has always been an institution in this community. We're 86 years old. We've been one of the largest private health and human services funders and advocates and conveners around issues that are important, you know, since our inception. I think what's different now is we're really trying to create a nimble United Way that is responsive to ever-changing community needs. Charlotte looks very different than it did even 10 years ago. We want to make sure that we are helping to create a table where everybody is welcome today. Well, I want to talk a lot more about that, but I do have one curiosity before we go any farther here. Uh, You're on all kinds of other community boards, and one that stuck out to me is that you chair the Federal Reserve Board uh, of Charlotte Board. And uh, how did that come about, and how does that fit in with the other things that you do? I do. It's It's a gift to get to have the opportunity to do that as well. 
one of the things that the Fed does that I don't think people realize as much is they, by putting people on the board that have different perspectives, they're using that as an opportunity to augment the economic data that they have. So they have lots of quantitative data about the conditions of the economy, but by putting together a diverse board with different perspectives from different industries, they're asking us to qualitatively tell them what's happening in the community. And quite frankly, sometimes in the health and human services world, which are sure, I'm sure our friends that the men's shelter and crisis can attest to, we see canaries in the coal mine when the economy may be starting to take a turn when the data aren't showing that yet. And so I think it's important for the Fed to have the health and human services sector represented on their board, and it's been a pleasure to get to do that. Interesting. I hadn't really thought about the Federal Reserve being part of this whole uh, a group of organizations in Charlotte that worries about this stuff, but they have a role to play as well. They have a really critical role to play, and, and we all, as members of that board, have a role to play in making sure that they're really you know, getting the on-the-ground information about what's happening. So does that information feed up to the Fed as they're making decisions about monetary policy? It does. Our, our um, conversations are summarized, and that information is then given to, in our case, the president of the Richmond Fed, and then he takes all of that into consideration as he's participating in those conversations conversations. Mm -hmm. So they, are they hearing about situations like we have here in Charlotte with the, the problems with economic mo mobility? And Absolutely, every single meeting. You know, it's fascinating to me as we've had uh, – a returning economy over these last few years, and certainly in Charlotte, we're seeing lots of people benefit. We're seeing lots of development. We go around the room, and you hear, you know, bankers and captains of industry, presidents of companies, talk about how great the economy is. And and they may now be talking about some labor pressures and things like that, but they're basically saying things are really good. And then it gets to me and the one other nonprofit representative, and we're often painting a very different picture. And I think. It's important for that group and for the policymakers and the economists to hear that Charlotte and our region really is a, a region of, a, you know, a tale of two cities still. And that while lots of people are benefiting from that booming economy, we are still at risk of leaving a lot of people behind. Just a quick thought. Uh, what can the Fed do to influence the situation here? I mean, they're looking at macroeconomic policy, but are there are things they can do? Well, I think the macroeconomic policy matters. I mean, I think having all of these different voices attend to that and be part of that conversation when they're making those kinds of decisions matters. You know, on a, a more micro level, the Fed can be very engaged in local community issues. And we've seen that here locally where Matt Martin, our executive at the Fed, was on the Opportunity Task Force. Um, he continues to be involved in, in work associated with that. He's on our United Neighborhood Steering Committee, for example. And so I think by, you know, it's one thing for me to show up at that table and offer insights, but I think it's important for our Fed executives to also be out in the community bringing their wisdom and expertise into our decision making too. Okay, well back to the United Way. Uh, how would you describe uh, the way that the United Way has changed over the years and um, how has fundraising changed? How has the way you give out grants changed? And, and we can go into great detail on that. And I'm also curious, is this happening at other United Ways around the country as well? Yeah, our United Way has been on a path of change for about three years now, where we've really looked at how we both raise money and how we allocate our funds and have, have overhauled from beginning to end how we make those decisions. It's still a volunteer-led process. We have hundreds of volunteers that inform those decisions every year, but we've aligned our priorities around the Opportunity Task Force recommendations to make sure that we are using those funds that we raise to address the most pressing needs that have been identified. You know, again, as the largest health and human services funder or private funder um, in the community, we feel an, a responsibility and an obligation to make sure we're standing at the forefront of how um, we need to be shifting what we do in our community to address those issues. On the fundraising side, I would say that, yes, things are changing. They are changing for most United Ways, if not all, across the country and have been. Workplace giving looks, in some cases, very different than it did historically. And so it means that United Way has to also think about how we secure funds differently. The workplace campaigns are always going to be our bread and butter. They're always going to be a big part of our revenue. But we also have to think about how do we cultivate individual donors how do we rebuild our muscle around uh, donor relationships so that people really understand the importance of United Way and why collective giving matters? 
because no one nonprofit can solve any of these issues. And if we don't have that general fund, uh, we're going to miss the opportunity to make a difference. Uh, let me just back up a minute and reminisce a little bit about my first contact with the United Way many years ago in another city, but it works the same way here. I remember that as an annual meeting where you were brought into the conference room with the boss and uh, cards were handed out. Uh, there was maybe a speech. Uh, uh, there was a chair who was one of your coworkers who kind of put the screws to you and said, you got to do this. And there was a big emphasis on everybody participating. And I, I, I just wonder if, not, if over the years we didn't lose touch with why we were doing this. I think that's fair. I think that people often felt obligated. You know, I've heard it referred to as the United Way tax. Um, I've heard stories about pledge cards, you know, maybe even being filled out before you walked in the room for you. You know, that's certainly not United Way today. Today, most of our campaigns are uh, much more open. That pressure has been taken off. We want people to give because they believe in United Way, and they believe that, particularly in Charlotte, this city is large, but it's still small enough that we can make a difference and we can see change. But it's going to take all of us pulling together in the same direction to make that happen. And again, you know, I like to say children don't come in pieces and parts. And so it's very difficult to address one issue here and another issue there. We really need United Way to be standing at, at the helm looking at all of the issues our volunteers helping to make those decisions, and then holding our partner agencies accountable for those outcomes. It does seem to me that uh, one of the things the United Way does differently now is we get a lot more case studies, a lot more of the argument about why you should do this. Um, but uh, you, you mentioned the term collective giving. Um, that's the original idea of United Way. How is that still at play, and why is it still important? I don't think it's changed at all. I really do, at the end of the day, think this is about a community coming together around an issue like economic mobility and saying, we will not stand for this. This is not the Charlotte that we want to live in or raise our own children in. And so in order to address those issues, when you look at the the Economic Mobility Task Force report, there's a hundred recommendations. It's a complex issue. And but for United Way standing at the center of that saying we're going to pull our resources together to address these issues effectively, I think we we miss an opportunity. So I think I think how United Way started and why it started is still very much the same today. Well, uh, let me ask you about, uh, you've taken this new job on. Before you did this, you were the chief impact officer um, doing many of the same things. What are your goals for the first year? I think the first year we have to keep the impact strategy moving forward. You know, when people asked if this was going to be, you know, very different from how Sean Garrett uh, viewed the world and led United Way, I would say from the impact strategy, you know, not. We worked together very closely on this. We developed it over the course of multiple years. Now we've really got to stick with it, implement it. I and think, want to, uh, tell us what that impact strategy is. What do you mean by that? Sure. So we have aligned around economic mobility and improving opportunity and creating opportunity for children and families in our community. We really have three funding strategies. One is our impact grants where we focus on education, financial stability, and health. But then we have United Neighborhoods, which is a holistic neighborhood approach where we're really trying to address multiple of those issues simultaneously in neighborhoods that have been high-need neighborhoods. And then finally, which we'll talk about with Brandon is Unite Charlotte, and that really is our work around um, racial equity and social justice. Now, the United Way still gives grants to local organizations, as it always has. There's been some shifting away from that to fund some of these new initiatives, but what are the major focus areas for the United Way in Charlotte? So still, our, our focus area within economic mobility is education, health, and financial stability. Within that, we have some specific priorities. Early childhood is really critical. We know that the research tells us that if we focus focus on children early in life, we're likely to get better outcomes. We know that providing wraparound services for families to help stabilize families is very important. What's, what's wraparound services? So wraparound services are all the things basically that we need to make healthy families and healthy communities. So um, whether that's social work services or services like crisis assistance provides, emergency financial assistance, health services, those kinds of things. That's Laura Clark, the new CEO of the United Way of Central Carolina, is joining us here on Charlotte Talks. We need to take a short break. We'll be right back.
Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Tyndall Subaru Gastonia, featuring the new Outback with EyeSight safety technology that sees problems and initiates action to help avoid trouble. Details at TyndallSubaru.com and on Facebook at Tyndall Subaru. And UNC Healthcare dedicated to engineering and delivering CART immunotherapy, a treatment that supercharges one's own cells to fight cancer. More at unclineburger.org slash immunotherapy. On the next Charlotte Talks, Americans don't get enough exercise. Many of us spend our days bound to desks with little time to get to the gym. We know we need to exercise more, but how much do you really need? There's good news in the federal guidelines released last week. Everything counts. Even short bursts of activity provide benefits. Experts fill us in on how to reverse the damage of our sedentary lifestyle and small ways to fit activity in throughout the day. That's when Charlotte Talks tomorrow at 9 on 90.7 WFAE. Millions of Americans are preparing to give thanks and feast with family, but many farmers are run ragged by a trade war and a bailout program bogged down in bureaucracy. The president's strongest supporters live and work in rural areas. What happened to the billions promised to counter new tariffs? I'm Joshua Johnson, finding a fix for our farmers, next time on 1A. 1A coming up from 10 to noon right after Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR News Source. This is Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE. I'm, Mike, I'm David Borak sitting in for Mike Collins, and we're talking about social services in Charlotte and the United Way. We'd also love to hear your comments. You can email charlottetalks at wfae.org or search for WFAE on Facebook and Twitter. Well, Laura, we were just talking about uh, the impact strategy of the United Way in Charlotte, and uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of initiatives. And uh, I guess as chief impact officer previous to this, you actually helped change the grant-making process, and you started these two major new initiatives. And you mentioned United Neighborhoods and United and Unite Charlotte. Let's start with the funding process. Um, how did that come about, and what has changed? Sure. So uh, United Neighborhoods is really a community-based grant-making program, and so we selected two neighborhoods as our flagships, Renaissance West and Greer Heights, and we have residents and community stakeholders that identify the priorities in those communities, invite organizations in to apply, and then really they make the recommendations as to what should be funded for those communities. For Unite Charlotte, this really started after the unrest that Charlotte experienced a couple of years ago, and the community, the funding community and others came together very quickly and said, we need to do something different. We need to to um, get new folks, new ideas, new organizations to the table, and maybe those that had not been invited to the table before. And so United Way took the lead with a grant from Wells Fargo and thought about how can we set aside some of the requirements that we have always had and are proud of because we want our agencies to be held accountable, but now understand that those have also, those requirements have sometimes created barriers for smaller organizations. Well, let's uh, stick with United Neighborhoods, the first one, for just a second here. And that focuses on those two neighborhoods you mentioned, Renaissance West and Greer Heights. First of all, why those two neighborhoods? We were looking for two communities that were already on a path of revitalization. We knew that United Way's funding, even though we made a multi-year commitment, would not be sufficient to start a neighborhood revitalization, and we didn't want to get ahead of ourselves. And so we looked for two communities that were on that journey, had already had some infrastructure established, some funding, and had a holistic approach. And that's really, really important. We weren't looking for organizations that were only focused on housing or only focused on education, but were instead building community. Uh, once before, you told me that there were 30 neighborhoods in Charlotte like this that need these kinds of services. Um, w how do you define those, and what parts of Charlotte are we talking about specifically? You know, specifically, most of those neighborhoods, unfortunately, do um, end up being in the crescent of Charlotte that we often talk about that is challenged in many ways because these are areas that, as a community, we disinvested in for many decades. And so we see them struggle with eroding housing stock, challenge schools, um, and a whole host of, of other things that we have the data, the quality of life data that the city tracks to, um, to you know, show that those neighborhoods are, are challenged. But I also want to be clear that just because a neighborhood is challenge in those ways doesn't mean that it doesn't have a heartbeat and that it doesn't have community. And one of the things that we were attracted to with both Greer Heights and Renaissance West is those corridors, those neighborhoods do have a sense of community and a sense of um, vision for what they want their community to be. And really United Way is just coming along to assist in that. 
Uh, so you're working with organizations in these two neighborhoods, and you described them in the past as community quarterbacks. And, you, you know, you funded some groups in other neighborhoods that you hope eventually will become the same thing. Um, wh- what is a community quarterback, and why is it important? A community quarterback wakes up every single day thinking about how do we uh, – improve this community? How do we lift up the voices of residents? And how do we hold a network of partners together and accountable for the outcomes that the residents want to see? And, you know, in my experience at Renaissance West, I can tell you that but for that, you know, you can have all good intentions aside, you can have lots of agencies committed, but if somebody's not waking up every day thinking about how to steer the ship and make sure everybody stays focused and keeps the children and families in the center of the conversation, then it can be difficult to make progress. So uh, what are we talking about in practical terms here with this initiative? How much money goes to the neighborhoods, and what is it being used for? Sure. So United Way made a $2.4 million commitment over three years to these two flagship neighborhoods, and then we've made six smaller grants to six other neighborhoods. But in both Renaissance and Greer Heights, we fund operating support for those community quarterbacks, but then we set aside about a quarter of a million each year in each community for the residents and community stakeholders to decide where that money goes. And we're in the first year of that granting cycle. And so what kinds of groups are getting those grants? It depends on the neighborhood. I mean, the neighborhoods decided what the needs are. So in both communities, I can tell you um, early childhood programming has been supported. So organizations like Charlotte Speech and Hearing have been funded. We've had um, financial services agencies funded, after school programs. It just depends on the needs of the community. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, the other major initiative is Unite Charlotte, and over the past two years, you've given away about $850,000 to grassroots organizations. Again, these are groups that maybe never would have gotten United Way funding, and uh, let's bring, bring Brandon Neal in here. Um, Brandon, what, uh, why did you get involved with this organization, and what is your goal for it? David, thanks. So I would say, and I would say anyone who knows me would tell you that I got involved in large part because I have a problem saying no. <laughs> and especially that's the case when it involves Charlotte and getting involved in the community and you add on top Laura Clark asking, uh, it's very hard for me to say no. But I think that the major reason is I would echo everything that Laura mentioned about being a native of Charlotte, but I also had the vantage point of being a transplant from New York. And my wife, who also grew up here, we went to CMS schools, uh, were part- partook in the IB programs, magnet programs. We were living in New York and we thought, where do we want to settle down? Where do we want to make a life for our family, a better way of life, have a lot of opportunity, and we settled no other place in Charlotte. And so we actually moved back to Charlotte from New York, and people thought we were crazy for the opportunity here, whether it be to be able to purchase a home, whether it be able to uh, continue in the finance industry in a place where we could have a good quality of life. And so when the events of the Keith Lamont, Sh- Keith Lamont Scott shooting happened, as well as the following the subsequent unrest, it really woke us up to think this is a place we came for opportunity. And that opportunity is not being shared by a huge swath of this same city that we love and that produced us. And so with that, we became very intentional about where do we want to spend our time, talent, and treasure? And for me, Unite Charlotte was one of those opportunities where we're going to look at things differently. We've done things the same way for a long time. Let's see if we can think outside the box. Let's think if we can support organizations, build up uh, organizations to build some of these wraparound services uh, where we can think, where we can not have this conversation in another 20 years. Well, uh, Brandon or Laura, uh, this uh, initiative, Unite Charlotte, came out of this Keith Scott shooting. And as many folks will remember, uh, after that police shooting in uh, Northeast Charlotte, there was a week of protests in Charlotte. And the issues were not just that police shooting, but everything else seemed to bubble up that was happening in Charlotte, all the economic inequality here. Um, what what was the thinking as you were putting this together? I mean, uh, so, what? go ahead. So I'll, I'll let Laura jump in here. For me, and someone who's been involved in a lot of Charlotte organizations and, and served on boards here, I think it's very easy to begin to treat the symptoms without ever addressing the underlying cause or disease. And so a lot of times when we have these police shootings or incidents in our community, everyone focuses on the symptoms. Um, But I think what really what we wanted to think about in Unite Charlotte are what are the underlying causes? What are, and I think this was the second gut punch or maybe even a knockout punch after the uh, social mobility, um, economic mobility study from Harvard that ranked Charlotte 50 out of 50th of of Metrolina areas in terms of economic mobility. So we really wanted to think through how do we begin to treat these symptoms? How do we think about things differently? How do we serve as a more of an active role instead of a passive pass-through United Way may have been um, in the past 
to really provide what we call in the financial industry is smart money. So we're going to fund, but we're also going to help you build capacity. We're also going to give you uh, guidance to how you succeed um, and teach you about how to actually apply for grants. And so, Laura, I don't know if you have anything to add there. but No, I think that's right. And I, and I would just emphasize that while the amount of money we've given out is relatively small, you know, we've invested in people in these organizations. And what we've heard them say to us over, over these almost two years now is, you believed in me, and you gave me a shot, and you let me come to the table, and you took a risk in some cases. And so we're really we're proud of that as much as we are of, of the actual dollars that were invested. So the grants that you make through Unite Charlotte are 3000 to 15000 um, As you As your committee is sitting down to decide who gets this money, uh, what are you looking for, and what has been the outcome? What are the kinds of groups that have been funded that maybe are, are new to the um, nonprofit funding? Yeah. yeah, so first of all, I'll, I'll give a lot of credit to our early, our first round, and we've had two rounds of this, because we did have traditional grant makers in the room. Um, so we had my colleague Jay Everett from Wells Fargo, Jennifer DeWitt from Duke Energy, um, Charles Thomas from Knight Foundation, Scott Vaughn from McGuire Woods, and many others. And I give them a lot of credit for saying, you know, this may not be an organization that we would fund traditionally, but this is an organization we have to fund now through this. And so since we are dealing with smaller dollar amounts, I think it gave the committee a little bit more confidence to say, you know, we're going to take a risk here. And we looked at organizations who are maybe thinking outside of the box, thinking of, well, I can potentially partner with this organization to do things a little bit differently. They were really looking through social justice um, to really make, I guess, uh, to improve racial equity in our city um, and things that would have an effect long term and also organizations that may be overlooked in other sources. So I would say we had a full list of metrics um, that we're in criteria we're looking at, but those were some of the uh, mains ones that we're looking at. I would say in terms of organizations um, that we found it, uh, Laura can tell you about some organizations that, that are doing great things. One that comes to mind um, for me personally would be uh, the Young Black Leadership Alliance through John Martin, which is taking young CMS, African-American students um, from all schools all around, putting them in leadership programs, taking them across the world, and then instilling in them that there's a sense of service that they need to give back. And so as someone, as African-American male who came up through CMS, I would have I would have loved that that program was around when I was here. Um, so that's one. And I would say the other one that really has an impact on me would be Profound Gentleman uh, by Jason Terrell, who we helped fund it. Um, and Jason is trying to keep uh, teachers, male teachers of color, in the schools. And we know the research shows that that will really help in some of our Title I schools. And so trying to create incentives to retain these teachers, uh, these are great things that, that we've been able to fund um, through Unite Charlotte and there are many other. I don't. One of the themes that's running through this is building community or rebuilding community. I mean, is that fair? Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. You know, if I think, I spend a lot of time thinking about what were the ingredients that helped me get to where I am and the people I've seen successful coming out of Charlotte. And it very much was a, a group effort, right? It starts at home, my family, no doubt about that. But all the organizations that helped me to get where I am, whether it be the school system, whether it be the libraries, whether it be all the programs that were there if I needed them. And so it really very much for us is how do we make sure these programs are available for everyone? Um, that is, we take the luck out of success, right? Uh, if I look at it, you know, I, I would like to say I did all this on my own. I, you know, my sheer will, uh, my determination, I'm a special guy. I would like to say that my wife would remind me that I'm not. Um, but, but it very much is there's a huge element of luck. And well, we want to take What is luck, right? Out. They say it's where preparation is right. opportunity, That's right? right? That's so. right. So if we, can, if we can help provide the opportunity as long and, and the preparation as well, I think we can help move the needle on some of these. Well, issues. Laura, uh, what about Southside Rides? What is that? So Southside Rides is a really interesting organization. It's run by a gentleman who had been in the prison system when he came out from being incarcerated. He wanted to give back to the communities where he had committed some of his crimes. And it started in Greensboro. He moved to Charlotte. And basically, he takes young young men and women and trains them to repair cars and fix cars and um, focuses on young men and women that are formerly incarcerated as well. And so these are folks that often would uh, be really challenged to find jobs. And so he's really taken his own experience and turned it into a positive for the community. Well, Laura, as somebody who's looked at a lot of the issues in the community, uh, I want to shift the focus now to talk a little bit about housing. And it's it's one of the main issues in Charlotte right now. Big picture, how would you rate Charlotte's housing uh, environment? I think we have an affordable housing crisis, and I think we would be remiss to not call it exactly what it is. I think that when we talk about housing, though, we need to be very mindful to talk about not just building housing, but building community. If we just build housing alone, 
uh, we will end up with some of the same challenges that we have. Those wraparound services that I talked about earlier, we need a lot to survive in the world. We need it in our own lives, in our own families, and folks that are struggling financially, putting a roof over their head they can afford is a very important first step, but we need to make sure they're going to be able to maintain that housing. And that's really where United Way and its partner agencies come in. We're, United Way is never going to build housing or is unlikely to, but we need to make sure that once families have housing, we need to advocate for housing, and then once they have it, that they're going to be able to maintain it through whether it's financial literacy or job training or whatever other services their family needs. Well, at the very uh, bottom end of the housing food chain is people who have no roof over their heads at all. Um, There are organizations in town that provide that. What role does United Way play with those groups? We provide funding to um, many of those groups, too, that are here today, Men's Shelter and Crisis Assistance that works, you know, gives emergency financial and eviction prevention assistance. We convene our shelter partners on a regular basis to help them work together more collaboratively, solve some of the problems that they're all facing. So, you know, we view ourselves as a partner with these agencies, helping to lift up their work as well. Well, let's bring uh, two more voices into the conversation here. Uh, Shanavia Shanavia Montgomery is the Chief Program Officer at Crisis Assistance Ministry, and Stephanie Chateau is Director of Shelter Services at the Men's Shelter of Charlotte. Welcome to Familiar with your organization. What is it? Um, Give us a little background. Our organization, Crisis Assistance Ministry, has been in the community for 43 years now. We're longstanding, and we serve as the lead organization in the Charlotte-Mecklenburg community for homeless prevention. So our job is to help our citizens remain housed. We know that becoming homeless is very expensive. So we want to help them maintain and sustain and to grow. Uh, We have economic mobility initiatives as well, but we want to help preserve dignity and restore hope for people. Um, Being in a financial crisis, people are challenged, and we want to be that organization that helps lift them out. I've heard that you guys serve 200 people a day in Charlotte. We do. Uh, I came into work early this morning uh, to, one, help prepare me for it this morning, but I am regrounded every time I pull into our parking lot. If you're ever there at 730, 8 o'clock in the morning, you will see the line wrapped around the building, especially this time of year. Uh, Last week on Tuesday, we had 198 people that were there seeking assistance for utilities, uh, people that were padlocked, that are, are trying to regain access to their home, people who are at risk for having their utilities disconnected or are already disconnected. You'd be amazed how many people are without heat this time of year. And it's especially hard. We know that people have limited resources, but this time of year is especially stressful. So we're we're there to help. So they need a little bit of financial help. They need some, what, counseling and some assistance getting services. Is that... So people arrive to our organization, um, and they are put into our what we like to coin as our emergency financial room, uh, our financial emergency room. So they're assessed and triaged. We find out the source of their crisis, and then we set them up with a caseworker who can interview them and uh, determine what the best way to resolve their crisis is. For some, um, it might be a temporarily stressed situation. You might have had a car repair or a funeral or... Um, needed school uniforms for your kids. And so that uh, unexpected expense put you into a crisis to where now you may not be able to pay your rent. Uh, As you mentioned, we we do have a housing crisis and uh, a lot of our folks, they are, um, they're stretched. So a minimum wage worker would have to work 103 hours a week. Real quick question here before we take a break. Uh, Where does the money come from? Do you have a bottomless pit of money? Oh, gosh, no. (laughs) We have very a very generous community. Uh, Our organization was founded upon that generosity uh, within the faith community. We uh, know that our donors understand that people in our community are unable to afford things like housing. So uh, we're thankful for organizations like the United Way. You're listening to Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Mazda of South Charlotte, dedicated to helping customers select vehicles that fit one's lifestyle. More at MazdaOfSouthCharlotte.com. And the Charlotte Symphony presenting the holiday film classic Home Alone. The full-length film will be projected on a giant screen as the orchestra performs the musical score live this Friday and Saturday at Belk Theater. Info at CharlotteSymphony.org. 
Coming up next on 1A, this summer, the U.S. Department of Agriculture put out its farm income forecast. It's estimated that profits for American farms would drop 13 percent this year, coming in nearly $10 billion under 2017's totals. 2019 isn't looking much better, but support for the president has risen or remained steady in major farming states. Will farmers stick with the president after the harvest? Joshua Johnson and his guests discuss. That's next on 1A in 20 minutes here on 90.7 WFAE. This is Charlotte. Hi, I'm Tommy Tomlinson, host of WFAE Southbound. Tuesday, November 27th is Giving Tuesday, a day to celebrate the charities that are making a difference in our shared community. Please consider supporting WFAE this Giving Tuesday by making a contribution at WFAE.org or by calling 704-549-9000. Thank you. It's Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE. I'm David Borak sitting in for Mike Collins. Today we're talking about social services in Charlotte, the United Way and services for homeless and people who are trying to keep from being homeless. homeless. Uh, we've been talking with Shanavia Montgomery, the Chief Program Officer for Crisis Assistance Ministry. What is your role there? My role is to uh, provide leadership to our people facing uh, employees and to lead all of our strategy around our programming. So we have a broad spectrum of services and are a very unique organization. So we provide emergency financial assistance. We provide uh, economic mobility and extended casework services. We have a furniture store where we help people uh, receive beds and dressers and even appliances if they are uh, escaping homelessness or uh, fleeing a situation where they need to relocate. And we also have a free store where we give out essential items, clothing, uh, small appliances, school uniforms, toiletries, uh, all for free, uh, thanks to the generous donors of our community. Well, uh there are folks who just cannot remain in housing. They don't have the money or they haven't had it. And uh, Stephanie Chateau is here from the Men's Shelter. And uh, just a little background on your organization. How long has it been around and uh, how does it serve the homeless in our region? Sure. So good morning. Um, so the Men's Shelter of Charlotte got its start um, really as an agency to um, be a safety net for folks that are, for men in our community that are experiencing homelessness. Um, it was a very cold winter night um, when three men um, froze to death underneath a bridge. Um, and our community decided that that was never going to happen again, that we were going to provide a better safety net than what we currently had. Um, and so from that, the Men's Shelter of Charlotte was born. Um, we uh, operate two shelters nightly, um, which provides shelter to 408 men on any given night. Um, and then during our cold weather, um, we will see more men than that on any given night. Uh, last year in January, folks will remember that the town out on the streets, um, what, how did the men's shelter and other shelters cope with that? So we really just open up our doors, and at one point we had um, over 100 additional men that were in the shelter. Um, we didn't have necessarily cots or beds or mats for everyone, but at least it was warm and it was dry, and we were able to provide um, food and shelter for those folks on those nights. One of the things I did during that cold spell last year was uh, to go around with the uh, Urban Ministry Center's uh, response team, actually going out and meeting po folks who were on the streets. and. Uh, you know, you guys have beds available. You try to get everybody in there, but there are some folks that won't come in. Why is that? So imagine living with 230 other people on any given night. That is not an easy thing to do for you or I. It's especially not an easy thing to do if you're suffering from a mental illness or if you have a substance abuse issue um, and you're not able to use that night or if you have a wife or you have um, a significant other and you don't want to be separated from that person. Um, the Men's Shelter serves men. Our Salvation Army Family Shelter serves women and children. A lot of times families are split up and they choose not to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the Men's Shelter recently spent $5.8 million to renovate the North Tryon Shelter. Uh, what did that pay for and how will that make a difference this winter? So that has just, I mean, that's made a huge impact in our community today. Um, it, what that renovation really did is give the guests that stay at the shelter privacy. It gave them a sense of dignity and respect because they now fully know that the community supports them and supports them on their journey toward ending that episode of homelessness. 
Um, it provided um, just a warm and welcoming space that we really didn't have before. Um, if you, I recommend anyone come out and see the new shelter if you haven't seen it, um, especially if you were there before. Um, it provided privacy in the showers. It provided pods for our guests, so it's not just an open bunk style. Um, each guest has their own space that they share maybe with one other guest. They have their own locker. Um, they have a sense of privacy. They have a sense of dignity. Um, it also opened up the space so that as far as safety goes, staff has much better line of sight throughout the entire shelter. Um, so it, it's really made an impact on the experience our guests have at the shelter. Well, that sounds like there'll be uh, there's, it's going to make for a big change in in the way you provide that service. Kind of big picture for both of you. Um, how have the services that you provide changed, or the way you deliver them over the years? Uh, thinking about how the United Way has changed, but on a kind of ground level, uh, how have things changed at crisis assistance? Well, as Laura mentioned, we are in an affordable housing crisis. So for our organization, we have seen a dramatic increase in people coming in seeking assistance for evictions. So in our community, we have about 30,000 evictions a year. I know. And uh, it's twice as large as cities such as Raleigh or Nashville that might be similar to us. Why is that? Uh, it's, it's tough. Um, unfortunately, rents increased about 35%. Uh, within the last five years, and wages have stayed essentially flat. So there's a lot of opportunity for some and not as much opportunity for others. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie, how about you? How have the services there changed? Or yes, So our work is really all about partnerships and collaborations. Um, again, we are also fighting the, the affordable housing. Um, our guests, on average, leave the shelter with income of less than $950 a month. Um, so housing options are very limited for them. And so um, we are constantly working with our partners to um, find those outlets for housing, um, whether that's through vouchers, through short-term subsidy dollars, the assistance of, of crisis assistance. Um, we just we continue to collaborate and work together. Well, uh, last year there was also another crisis with many of the social service agencies. There was a loss of some federal funding, not all of your funding, but a piece of it. Um, I think there was $500,000 back in June was taken away by FEMA. Um, what is that program and what happened there? Uh, and I'm going to throw this to anybody who can answer it. Laura, Laura maybe. Sure, Laura I'll start. So this is a program that's just administered by United Way. We were a pass-through for these FEMA dollars that for years had come into our community at about that level. Um, and, you know, we'd seen some dips here and there over over the years, but this past year, the funding was stripped entirely, and it was very difficult initially to understand why. Um, if anybody's ever been involved in seeking government funding or kind of understanding how those decisions are made, it can be a little hard to wrap your head around. And ultimately, we were told that our poverty rate just wasn't high enough anymore, that it had basically dipped right below, you know, a threshold that somebody set somewhere. Um, and luckily, we were able, with our partners like the Men's Shelter and Crisis Assistance and others, to advocate to return some of those dollars to the community for this year. So that begs the question, what about next year? It does beg that question, and I, and I wish I knew the answer. I think we have to be prepared for, you know, to not get those funds again. And what was wonderful to see this past year was both, number one, how our partners came together to advocate. We had some elected officials help us advocate at the national level as well. But then we had the faith community um, really show up and come together. And, and I know you guys may want to add to that. For what they did. We have a very generous community and Charlotte's big. We've got a big heart and as Laura stated there was no lack of transparency um, from United Way uh, around this issue and we are very confident that people understand the plight of those that are in need in our community. We have about 15 percent poverty in Mecklenburg County. Um, that's tremendous but I am confident that if challenges are incurred in the future that we're going to come together and be able to bridge those gaps and continue to serve and have seamless Services. Stephanie, any thoughts on that? I think that's always a struggle for nonprofits, that it, our funding sources are always changing. There's always that ebb and flow. Um, we have to be as resilient and resourceful as the men that we serve are. Absolutely. Um, and we have to come to work every day and get the job done and, and help our men move beyond that episode of homelessness, whether a funding source has been cut, and we have to go after three other ones to, um, to make up for that funding source. We owe that to the men that we serve. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me 
kind of look at this cold weather that is coming. It's a beautiful day here in Charlotte right now, but we know that it's going to get cold again, and we probably will have cold snaps like the one last January. How well prepared are we from a social service standpoint in Charlotte this year to uh, withstand another crisis like that? So I can say that we've learned a lot from the lessons of last year, and we have started to work much earlier with our community partners um, on what our um, overflow and what our extreme weather policies will be. Um, it's really about capacity, and it's about at what point do we open up an additional shelter. And so we feel that um, we have some of those things in place now where we really didn't last year. Uh, last year, one of the complaints uh, by some public officials was that uh, the county didn't act fast enough. And I, I, do you think that was true, or uh, what role does the county have to play here? Eventually, they did open an emergency shelter that did get some other people off the streets, but then it came back to the same thing. There were people who just didn't want to come in from the cold when it was eight degrees out there. But um, So the, the county is one of our valuable community partners, and they have been um, one of the leading forces at the table to make some of those decisions earlier um, and how we can better prepare now so that we're not in that crisis situation when the need arises. Um, from your st standpoint, uh, Shanavia Montgomery of uh, Crisis Assistance Ministry, are, how well prepared are we this year? I believe we're very well prepared. Again, the community is always responsive to this need. We see higher utility bills this time of year, and so we are prepared to assist people to either restore their heat um, or ensure that their heat remains on, uh, especially for our more vulnerable neighbors that may be seniors. Um, it's not uncommon for people to arrive at our organization and their heat has been disconnected uh, for the year. So we want to make sure that that's restored. Um, we're also looking at making sure that people have warm coats, warm blankets, so we encourage people to drop those items off so that we can give them out free of charge to those who might, might be in need. Well, uh, throw this out to all of you. What can we do? What can I do as an individual here in the Charlotte area who is looking at these issues and wondering, you know, how do we, how do we help those who are less fortunate? So I, I have a couple things I'd add. Um, one is we're thrilled that the housing bond passed. I think that's a great first step, but it's a billion-dollar problem. And our agencies here, Men's Shelter, Crisis, others are doing everything they can every year to fill this gap. But we're going to continue to have that problem until there is more affordable housing. And so, you know, what I told people before the election was vote for the bond and then call your elected officials the next day and ask them what the next step is and when the next bond is going to be available. And so I think that's one thing we all need to do is be advocates. Secondly, we're headed into the season of giving. And the need exists year-round, but this is a time of year when people are often looking for ways that they can get involved. All of these organizations, United Way included, need your gifts. We need to be able to continue to provide the services that you've heard talked about today, and we need the resources to do that. And then finally, always important, is volunteer. Get involved. You know, Hands on Charlotte is part of United Way. You can go onto our website. You can find individual or group activities to get involved with. Each of these organizations and others have ways that you can you can volunteer your, your time and your talent to, and that really matters every single day. This is a really big picture question about those bond, bonds, but how will that $50 million help to solve our problem, and where should they be mm -hmm. spending it? Well, that's probably for a, a longer conversation on another <laughs> show, and I'm not the expert. Um, what I can tell you is I think it's a step in the right direction. It's a good thing. Um, I think if it was me deciding where to spend it, and I know it's really hard to decide and the financial um, aspects of it are very complicated, but what we did at Renaissance West with a mixed income community where you have folks that are living in lower income housing right next door to market rate units and you're building a community around that, that to me is the ideal situation and the more of that we can do, the better. Agreed. There's about a 34,000 housing unit, affordable housing unit deficit in Charlotte right now for people that are at that 60% uh, area median income. Um, so the housing bond, I think, will help us to address that problem. And then there's great work going on with the Leading on Opportunity Task Force and the report that came out that will help us address those issues and give us the North Star uh, so that we know what we're working towards. So I think there's a lot of good work in the community around collaboration and helping develop a system that's going to address the process issue that will help us um, hopefully meet the needs of the people that we're all working so hard to and serve. I, I would Go say, ahead, as, as the one civilian here, <laughs> I, think it, I think it's incumbent on us who um, probably are not, don't touch these issues on a daily basis to do what I've heard I've heard called Charlotte the 72 degree city where you can leave your house, get into your car, yes. go into your uh, uh, overstreet crosswalk without ever stepping outside to really take a moment to think through 
what is going on outside of our bubble? Um, what are people like Laura and everyone here really focusing on day in and day out and seeing what we can do to just learn more and think about things differently. One quick example I'll give on the men's shelter, one of my best friends, uh, Will Austin, chaired the board and, you know, I thought I was just going to sign up and give my money and he said, well, I also need advocacy because we need to stay as close to uptown as possible because that helps the men we serve. And I probably wouldn't have thought of that if I hadn't stepped out to think, okay, what can else can I do to help? And I think that's what we can all do. Absolutely. Dropping off a coat to crisis assistance ministry or making a financial donation, um, or as you just said, just learning more. Um, we're currently partnering with the Arts and Science Council and the Levine Museum of the New South to learn more about racial segregation and our history in Charlotte and our past so that we can better address the needs of the people that we're serving. Uh, unfortunately, people of color are five times more likely to experience poverty, so it's important that we understand the root cause of that issue and be able to come up with solutions that are going to be based on identifying um, ways that we can more effectively serve. Well, Brandon, uh, the Unite Charlotte initiative was started after the Keith Scott shooting and those protests that brought out all of these underlying social issues. Uh, there have been many different efforts over the years. Your group is one. The housing bond is another. Big picture, how are we doing in addressing those issues that came out in 2016? Yeah, you know, I think it's challenging. There are systemic issues that are going to take time to to solve, and I don't think we'll see the fruits of our labor until very much later. And I think that's the beauty of the Unite Charlotte is that we weren't tied to immediate metrics, which may cause more damage uh, long term. But I think I, I feel positive. I think we're having the conversation. I think that's the first step. Uh, the housing bonds help, but I think it takes everyday citizens like myself waking up to say, "Oh, wow." We need to do something about this. This is not the opportunity, Charlotte, that I experience. Uh, what can we do, and how can I make it better for my children and other children? Uh, so I think we'll see it, and I hope in 20, 20 years we're not having the same conversation. Brandon, you get the last word here today. That's Brandon <laughs> Neal, chair of the Unite Charlotte Thank Committee you, under the United Way. We've also been joined by Laura Clark, the CEO of the United Way of Central Carolinas, Shernavia Montgomery, chief program officer of Crisis Assistance Ministry, and Stephanie Chateau, director of shelter services at the Men's Shelter. Thank you so much for your time. I'm David Borax filling in for Mike Collins. This has been Charlotte Talks.